Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Power of Chocolate program at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, my name is Diana Sochil Mun. I used to be part of the Smithsonian family, but I moved to Harvard University just you know, a few hours away, uh, where I'm director of public programs for the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. And I'm delighted to be here to be the sidekick of the one and only Jerome Grant. Is he is the chef of our amazing cafe, the Mitzitam Cafe. I'm trying to pronounce it right, but yeah. Jerome has another. So yeah, I'm the chef of the Mitzitam Cafe. We're in uh, Native Piscataway, and Mitzitam means let's eat. So, um, you know, a lot of people come to the right place here, I guess you could say that. But um, what we do is here, we strive to coincide our food with Native American culture, as well as with a lot that goes on in the museum through the various festivals, exhibit, uh, exhibits, and things like that. So, you know, we're more of the, the food in motion type of parts of the, to the museum. Um, today we're going to go over a couple of uh, cool items that we do here in the cafe, as well as uh, that also coincide with Cherry Blossom Festival and Chocolate Festival. Um, it seems like year-round Chocolate Festival and Cherry Blossom Festival really coincide together. So you're always getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the nice sweet and chocolatey type of thing, and you're getting the nice sour and tart cherries. So, you know, we, we come up with a lot of awesomely cool things here. Um, a lot about us, you know, we change our menu four times a year with every season, so there's always something fun. Um, us here at the Miss Temp Cafe, we pretty much strive to really be as innovative as possible, but as indigenous and as authentic to the cultures as we can. Um, a lot of the pro products that we do have here, we source from a lot of Native Americans. Um, everything from our wild rice we get from Red, Red Lake Nations, our salmon from the Quinault tribe, our buffalo from uh, ITBC out in South Dakota, which is a buffalo co-op. So, you know, we, we really work hard with the tribes. Um, alongside that, we bring in a lot of juices from the Seminole Pride. So definitely check out those juices. Those are all Native, Native uh, American grown fruits from Florida. So it's always really trying to A, be in touch with the Native culture, as well as the, the, the Native tribes, and really push for what they have in their products throughout our cafeteria. So we're gonna start on a couple of dishes. The first dish we'll start off, which is actually a savory play on chocolate will be a uh, chili and chocolate brine pork chop that we actually have Berkshire pork that we get cut just for us. And we were, we're gonna brine it in a uh, salt and sugar mixture with uh, cocoa nibs and uh, chili de arbor. The great thing about brining pork is it really adds to the, it adds another dimension to pork. It won't really dry it out, it'll add a lot more moisture to it, and then it'll take on another uh, flavor profile. Generally, we brine a lot of items here in our cafe, whether it's our wild uh, turkey, uh, some of our fishes, and uh, as well as various other meats that we get. We're gonna do this like our traditional brine, but we're gonna change it up a little bit by adding a little cocoa nibs to it. So first, we'll go ahead and add our water to it. And I should say that um, while you can taste all of these dishes at the cafe, if you want to try them at home, you may want to uh, take notes. We may have them online later on, but they're not available right away. So we'll add a little bit of uh, canela, which is a uh, Mexican cinnamon, our chili de arbol, thyme, and we'll add whole shallots to it. Um, for me, I'm kind of lazy at times, just makes it much more easy for me to pull out. But uh, at the same time, it really enhances the flavor. Allspice, some garlic, as well as star anise. Uh, the key to a brine is really getting the, the, the proper sugar and salt combination together. Um, for every half cup of sugar, we add one cup of salt, so it really balances out. Um, here we use a lot of brown sugar. Uh, for us, it, it gives us a, a more dramatic flavor to it. Uh, it gives it that nice caramel, nice scentiness to it, instead of just using the, you know, the regular refined sugar. So we'll add our brown sugar. We'll add some salt to it. And then finally, we'll add cocoa nibs to it. The cocoa nibs won't give it that overly chocolate flavor, flavor where it's like you're eating a candy bar. It'll give it that nice essence of chocolate. You'll get the nice aroma from it and everything else like that. So it really works out well with the uh, pork. So as that goes, we're gonna let it bring up to a boil and we'll actually start making the rub for it. So our rub consists of cocoa powder, Coriander, a 
cumin, and a little bit more salt. The great thing about this is it's going to give it that nice chocolatey, crusty type of flavor. So when you initially bite into it, you get that nice chocolate and uh, rusty flavor from the cumin and the coriander up front. But then as you get internally to the meat, it's just like nice and flavorful. It adds that nice salty and sweetness on the inside of it. Um, what we'll do is we'll kind of uh, turn this into kind of like a lab of some sorts and we'll fast forward the time. Generally, we brine our pork chops for about a day. So we'll brine them for a day. We'll take them out, let them dry, dry for another day, and they'll be ready for the, the rub and the grilling uh, for service. So what we've done is we pretty much brought this up to a boil so all the flavors are in there. It's kind of like steeping it, kind of like tea. And we'll add a little ice to it. We want to rapidly cool this down to stop the, the flavor from cooking and just really seize the flavor that we have there. So we pulled it down rapidly, and we'll pour it right over the pork that we have. So again, we'll let that sit. We already have our rub done. And at the same time, we'll go ahead and start the sauce. OK. Um, does everyone here know where chocolate comes from? OK, so before we leave the program today, all of you have to come away with um, some understanding of, hopefully, where chocolate um, is from. I um, should invite you to check out these wonderful trees, one across um, the way in the back uh, in the Mars area demo um, station. And then there's one uh, to my left. So chocolate comes from a tree a tree that likes to grow in tropical regions. Um, it is native to what is today southern um, Mexico and Guatemala. Um, in many of the demo tables, you're going to find this, which is a cacao pod. This is the fruit that this tree produces after the flowers have been pollinated by tiny insects and they have become fertilized and they develop into this lovely fruit. This is actually a rather small one. It's still not quite ripe. But when you open it, voila, you are going to see all of the seeds, um, about 20 to 40 that are embedded in this um, white, um, I don't want to call it a mess, but it's very sticky, and it, uh, it smells all right, but uh, in order to get to the seeds, you want to ferment all of this, you want to dry the seeds, and you want to roast the seeds in order for them to release the aromas and the flavors that we associate with chocolate. If you were to bite into just a raw chocolate seed, it would be very, very bitter. So it has to go through a very long process before it can become the chocolate that we love so much. And um, after the program, you can uh, go through that long line and learn more about the process uh, to produce chocolate. All right, so we'll go ahead and get the sauce started. So what we'll do is we'll start off getting our pan hot. And we'll actually add cocoa butter to it. The great thing about cocoa butter has all sorts of great health values to it. Um, it's great for your skin, of course. But at the same time, it has a lot of uh, essential nutrients for your body. Uh, it aids in uh, cell repair after workouts and things like that. And it uh, has a, a low cholesterol fat content to it, which is actually kind of crazy. But uh, so what we'll do is we'll get this hot. We're actually going to caramelize some, uh, some shallots and add a little red wine to it, cook it down, and almost make like a, a, a caramelized onion, a caramelized shallot with it, but a little bit of brown sugar that, to, to help sweeten it out. The person who just uh, came to speak to me mentioned that at the Botanic Garden um, across the street towards the Capitol, uh, they do have a cacao tree that actually has the pods on the tree. So if you have time to go and see that, that would be really nice. The trees that we have right now are actually flowering, but they don't have any pods. So we've added our shallots to our pan. We'll give them a nice little saute. We'll add a little salt to it. This will aid in the, as we cook the, uh, the shallots, it'll bring out some of that natural sugar to it, so it won't really boil, you know? While we're going there, 
We'll go ahead and take our pork chop out. And we'll dry them out. And again, generally we keep this in brine for about a day. So you're getting the uh, sped up version of this. <laughs> if at any point anyone has a question, please feel free to ask. So we'll put some of our rub on there and kind of pat it in there. We really want the, uh, the flesh of the meat to really absorb this. right here on our grill plate. We'll let that cook. So we're starting to get this nice light brown to our, uh, our shallots here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of the, uh, yeah, brown. Yeah, fine. A little bit of maple syrup, just sweeten it up. Add some red wine to it and just let it cook down. These shallots will turn nice and sweet and really complement the chocolate, the chocolate flavor to the pork chop. So while that's going on, we're gonna talk about a couple of things that we do here. We do this awesome wild rice and grain bar here, which um, it's pretty cool. The whole thing about it is, you know, it's a nice healthy bar, but uh, I wouldn't be demonstrating it right now, but it gets a little messy. So I'll kind of talk you through it. But um, what we do is we take wild rice and pop it just like uh, popcorn. In a sense, you can pop almost any kind of rice, you can pop almost any kind of grain. Just as like grains will sprout, the same thing with uh, grains they'll pop. So we take our wild rice, we heat up oil for about 400 degrees, and we pop it in there just like uh, Rice Krispies. They literally look just like Rice Krispies. We take those, we pop those, we pop quinoa, and then we go ahead and toast off flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and then we add a little uh, dried cherry to it. At the same time, we actually make a coconut caramel. So we take coconut milk, a little bit of maple syrup and brown sugar, and reduce that down and use that to bind it together. Um, the one that we did today, we added a little bit of uh, Mexican chocolate to it. So it's gonna have like a nice earthy flavor to it to go along with the woody grains, but it really gives it a, a nice chocolate finish to it. So my sous chef Steve's actually passing that around. Um, you can definitely try, sample them, and we do have them in the cafeteria. And I think that the recipe is on the Washington Post. Yep, the, the recipe is on the Washington Post plate, uh, plate, get, plate lab. So while um, the pork chops are cooking, yep. <laughs> um, something that um, you'll learn about in some of our demonstration tables today is that um, Chocolate was cultivated in ancient Mexico, has been cultivated uh, there for a very long time. And by studying ceramic, uh, ceramics from archaeological sites in southern Mexico and in Guatemala, scientists have been able to determine that people living in those areas have been consuming chocolate-based beverages or other foods for at least 2,500 years. So that is a very long time. Um, but Euro Europeans didn't really know chocolate. Chocolate, uh, again, is, is native to the Americas, and so it was only after the conquest that chocolate was introduced to Europe, and Europeans, um, innovative as they are, um, invented new ways of processing uh, the chocolate seeds to produce things like the cocoa powder that we're so familiar with today, or to produce the candy bars that we love so much. And talking about um, our love for chocolate, something that um, I like to remind people of is that in ancient Mexico, only the very, very wealthy had access to chocolate. 
Um, common folk did not. So we are very lucky to be able to eat chocolate today. Um, in ancient Mexico, um, at a wedding cer ceremony, for instance, you would exchange vessels of chocolate. It was just such an elite um, beverage. Um, and the Aztecs who lived in what is today Mexico City um, had to obtain their chocolate seeds from other indigenous groups in uh, southern Mexico because the tree does not grow in Mexico City. It's very, very high. It's a tree that likes the lowlands, tropical areas. If it's below 60 degrees, it just won't make it. So the trees that we have here are from the greenhouses of the Smithsonian's Horti Horticulture Division. All right, so while this is cooking, we'll actually start uh, making our ice cream base to move on to the dessert part. Wow, so fast. <laughs> we started uh, cooking earlier today, yeah. so Jerome and I all, all already had a rhythm. Does anyone have any questions about any of the recipes about chocolate? No, you're all mesmerized. I like this. Uh, we are going to be able to sample the high-tech ice cream that Jerome is going to make shortly. Is that right? Yes. Yes, yes. But you will, be, you will have to be patient. And I believe that that ice cream is not available yet, but no, it will it be. It will be available in the summertime. Uh, we're actually working on trying to put together native-inspired uh, ice creams at a coffee bar here. So wow. it's, you know, really trying to take native ingredients and try to be in as, in as, as, in, sorry, as innovative as possible. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. as innovative as possible, but yet really be true to the culture, but also, you know, be a little transcendent, you know, be more inviting to the guests that come in and, and understandable for them. So I'm going to get um, away from the liquid nitrogen, because all of a sudden Jerome is going to make some magic. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and separate the eggs, and we're just only going to use the oats, the yolks. So in a sense, I'm almost creating a custard. What I've done here is take a little heavy cream, our sugar. But the ice cream we're going to do is not just going to be like a regular ice cream. It's like a play on the whole savory type of thing where it's like, you know, understanding that vegetables are great for you, but also have extremely great qualities versus while you're cooking them. So we're going to make a parsnip and white chocolate ice cream. We're going to steep our parsnips in here along with the sugar and just bring it up to a nice uh, slow boil. At the same time, we'll add some white chocolate to finish it off. White chocolate actually just won't enhance the flavor, but it'll enhance the creaminess of the, uh, the ice cream itself. So I'll go ahead and separate these yolks. Something that I, um, I don't think I've mentioned and which hopefully might help you appreciate um, chocolate a bit more is that the pods that I showed earlier these have to be removed from the tree by hand. There is, there's no machine or mechanical way to remove the fruits. You have to do it by, by hand. And one of the reasons is that the areas on the bark, this is a, a drawing that one of my friends, Alice Tangerini here, who is one of the scientific illustrators at the National Museum of um, Natural History, uh, she does fine drawings. This is not one of her drawings, but she found this in the collections of the museum. And it shows how the flowers are growing on the bark of the tree. Now, if you were to remove this fruit and damage that area where the flowers are coming out of, you might then damage that whole section and it may not produce more pods. So you need to be very careful. Now think about all the chocolate we consume and all the human labor that goes into getting these pods off the tree. Um, today, most of the chocolate that we consume comes from different African countries in the tropical area of the African continent. Um, but today you also find a lot of these fine bars, right, Jerome, that um, include cacao that is grown in specific plantations in many different countries. Um, so I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about the fact that nowadays you can find a lot of unique 
Oh yes. Chocolate bars, and I'm not, and I'm not sure what what is the what is, what is going on with with that. Why is there such an interest in these? Well, I know, um, especially like in South America, there's been a a, a big grow and uh, really a great understanding of Andean style chocolates, where they pretty much forage throughout the Andean mountains to find the uh, the cocoa pods. Um, I was recently in Ecuador, and it was just you know, Ecuadorian chocolate was just awesome out there. Um, I had a chance to really see the cocoa pods and everything like that. And the crazy thing about it is, as, uh, as you were saying, the inside of those pods, if you taste them raw, they're actually sour. So it's crazy how something so sour could be something so sweet or something so bitter. So it, it, it's really a, a cool item to play with. So I've heard um, different people talk about um, being able to remove that pulp and making a sweet beverage uh, with it. Um, but for, I, I have not come across any records uh, pertaining to what is today, I mean, to Mesoamerica that discuss that. All right, so our pork chop's done. Um, as you can see, it gets a really nice color on it. What we'll do is we'll just top it off with a little bit of the caramelized uh, shallots. And we'll add a little bit of that uh, cocoa butter in there. The great thing about the cocoa butter, it really just brings the dish together itself. Um, it's one of those oils or butters that I just don't really mind eating. It just tastes so great, smells so great. And it really adds a, a, a great flavor to the dish. Jerome, someone asked a little earlier where you could get that kind of butter. You could actually get it from like Whole Foods and Harris Teeter. I know Trader Joe carries it. Um, we, we just buy a ton of it. I mean, it's, it's great. I have it in my home. Along, you know, we really don't use butter where I live at, for some weird reason. Um, but um, <laughs> we use a lot of like cocoa butter, almond oils, things like that. Um, cook with a lot of avocado oil. Um, and at the same time, we, we try to do those same things in the cafe. Um, a lot of our food, we really kind of look at it as far as like, what what would you do back in the day? You know, back in the day there wasn't a lot of processed things and stuff like that. So we're really trying to rethink the, thing, rethink the whole food movement for us here at the cafe with using raw vinegars, um, using the raw sugar like we'll talk about shortly and uh, things like that. So, yeah. So we pretty much let our cream steep here. Before we get to the ice cream, um, I don't think I mentioned that in what is today Mexico, um, the beans, the seeds of chocolate were used as currency. Did I mention that? No? So I, I did mention that only the elite had access to the beverage, correct? Right. Well, in addition to that, you would use the seeds um, as money to buy anything you wanted. And um, according to the records written by after the conquest by Spanish friars, um, the Aztec em Empire had warehouses completely full of seeds. And we're not talking about thousands. We're talking about millions and millions of them. And um, so they, they really knew how to stash their, their money. But just imagine money growing from trees, literally, and two, making beverages out of money. I think that's pretty unique. So what I've done is I've strained out the parsnips from our cream mixture. I add a little bit of the white chocolate at the end of it. And then we'll let that cool down for a second before we uh, temper it into our egg yolks. So while that's going on, I'm gonna go ahead and start the sauce. Watch out, see? So our sauce is real simple. It's gonna be uh, pitted cherries that we're gonna let cook down and kind of let it re release the uh, moisture. And we're gonna add peel and seal to, to sweeten it up or dolce atado. It's pretty much unrefined sugar. Um, it's packed in a nice corn husk. It just has a really, really great flavor to it. Um, it's not like your processed sugar where it's like, you know, it feels like you're eating the wrong thing. Now this is, this is great. So uh, the crazy thing about it is it's really dry.
So we'll shave a little bit off. We'll add our cherries to it. And then we'll add the sugar to it. So let that go, and again, we'll just let it cook down. The cherries will give off a lot of their moisture and stuff like that. While that's going on, my sous chef Steve's actually gonna temper the, uh, the hot cream with the eggs. Um, I'm just terrible at it, I always make scrambled eggs. So, he'll jump onto it for me. So he slowly adds a little bit at a time because if you do add a lot of it fast, the eggs harden up and it literally turns into scrambled eggs. It's pretty crazy. So we're pretty much good to go to make the ice cream. The great thing about the way that we're gonna make ice cream, we're gonna use a little liquid nitrogen. We could actually just start from hot. It'll instantly cool down the ice cream, virtually turn like the whole ice cream process into just a couple minutes. Um, it's kind of the, the, the reverse technology of the slow churned ice cream. Um, it's a little bit more, more rapid and more modern. At the same time, it gives this ultra creamy texture to it. And it'll help stop it from overly cooking where you kind of lose the flavor. So we'll get it going. So we should be just about ready. <laughs> well, you might not want to do that. <laughs> continues. So. Has anyone ever had ice cream made with liquid nitrogen? Oh, one person. Yeah, it's like the hot thing. Or the cool thing, rather, right? Uh, I, I think we just cheat a lot. <laughs> All right. So who's ready to try some ice cream? Okay, a few, that's good, that's good. I'm glad that not everyone wants ice cream today. Um, we're gonna come out and uh, give you some samples. If uh, you stay in your seat, and um, I'll, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna get to you. What do you think? Should I try? I tried it um, at the program we did um, earlier today. It was really good. This is my way to get my sample. Mm. 
it's yummy. And um, I was telling Jerome earlier today that to me it tastes like vanilla, but um, but it's not really vanilla. Uh, but if you're into vanilla ice cream, you're really going to love this. Yeah, you get like that nice woody flavor from the parsnips as well as like a little bit of that chocolate to it. So it's a, it's a really cool way of just, you know, kind of thinking outside the box and really adding the additional vegetables and things like that. But why parsnip? Of all things. Uh, we do we do a lot of wild things, I guess. That's why. Um, no, like our, our whole MO for this year has actually been looking at taking the savory and making them sweet and making the sweet savory. Uh, thus, hence, you've seen the wild rice bars. We turned that into like a nice, healthy dessert. But then at the same time, we've taken things like the parsnips or the beets and turned it into a dessert. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that was our big play this year, especially throughout the uh, summer. I mean, I'm sorry, throughout the winter and then going to the spring and the summertime. Right. Um, right now, we feature a couple of cool things uh, where, what are we doing now? We're doing a, a calabasa custard. So it's actually a, a pumpkin custard with a tomato marmalade. You know, that, that's a dessert for us. And we're actually sweetening up the tomato marmalade with a peel and seal. So it's, you know, it's, it's just kind of just doing different things and just really having fun with it and showcasing the native and indigenous ingredients to, you know, maybe not what was done in the past, but using the same cooking techniques, but, you know, making it more innovative nowadays at the same time, so. So, Jerome, well, the ice cream is being um, served. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about your creative process? Uh, we change our menu four times a year with the, within the seasons. Um, our cafe is split up into five different uh, stations that represent the Northern Hemisphere. So every station has some, every station is different. So in a sense, we write five different menus. The crazy thing about that is we actually take the regions, we take what's local and indigenous, and also what's seasonal at that time. So, you know, it's a lot of sourcing of ingredients and things like that. It's making a lot of phone calls, trying to find various herbs, trying to figure out, well, okay, springtime, you know, fava beans and peas are indigenous to the Northwest Coast. Well, we know that's where we're gonna put it there. And what kind of uh, trout run in the Northern Woodlands during this time and stuff like that. So we really need to sit down, we really sit down and kind of think about the menu and, and, and figure out at the time what's, what's appropriate for that time. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chef Jerome no Grant, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, no problem. And I think we're ready for a little ice cream. Thanks so much for participating in our program today.